Intended is brought to you in part by YTH, an initiative of ETR. YTH's team has decades of experience in public health, research, capacity building, and health education. Using technology and social media to engage young adults in fields like reproductive and sexual health, they pilot innovative solutions to big problems like mental health, sex education, and cyberbullying. One of YTH's projects is Zona Segura, a program that uses the ubiquity of mobile phones to address teen dating violence in Honduras. By providing prevention information, healthy relationship education, and linkage to services and resources, Zona Segura assists young people in overcoming the barriers between them and rights-based, gender-sensitive domestic violence prevention. Learn more about YTH and all their programs at yth.org. Again, that's yth.org. Well, first off, I just think people are always skeptical of things they haven't seen yet, right? I don't know if you guys remember before, like, the first iPad came out. Everybody was, like, mercilessly making fun of it. They were like, this is so silly. I got a laptop. I got a phone. Why would I need this? And they made fun of the name and all this stuff. But, like, then as soon as it was out, the the joke ceased, and everyone was like, oh, yeah, this is actually a really useful tool that now everyone uses, right? Um, so Will Skinner is a graduate so I, student at the University of California in Berkeley. We actually talked with him in the third episode. He's getting his PhD, working in a lab, doing science, and he's researching sperm motility. He's trying to hinder it in order to make a birth control for men. He and I were talking recently, and we got on the subject of frequently asked questions. People always seem to be interested in this line of work, you know, like when you're at a dinner party and jobs come up. I asked him, what's the first thing that comes up? What's the first thing that people ask you? The first, right? The first thing people will say is, is, do you think men will take it? This question comes up a lot, like every single time. Now the question is, <laughs> is the guy going to take it? No. You no. Know, I don't think they're going to do this. You want to know why? 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 Men can't even handle a cold. Do you think they're going to yeah, no, get no. a shot? Right. And I will tell you this. All right, listen up, guys. Here's a question that will get you thinking. Would you take male birth control? Right now, KU doctors are looking for men to test it out. It's not a pill. PCT five. What? It's just like the birth control pill for yes. women does. And I wonder if men will take it. But don't you think they don't men would that. want to take it so that they have control over but they won't remember. whether or not? We've been putting off talking about this. Will gets asked about it. We get asked about it, and it seems to be the big question, the one that like every single news article asks. The people just can't let go of. If there were a birth control for men. Would men use it? And we're going to talk about that today. But first, there are issues with just throwing all men into the same pot. Would men use it? And the answer, of course, to that is not all of them at first, certainly. And probably never all of them. But we are talking about an enormous slice of people, right? Three and a half billion people that we're talking about here. So even if... When you put a few billion people together, there are bound to be some differences. Asking if men, as this vague collective, will use contraception, it's kind of a weird question. There are men with different motivations, different cultures, and their own lines in the sand drawn everywhere. No two guys are going to think alike on this subject. But if we do zoom out, look at a bunch of men collectively, there's lots of data to show that in most cases, a majority of men are at least interested in and excited about male contraception. Sure, that means that there are some men who aren't interested and they're going to have their own reasons for that. But let's move on from the idea that nobody is going to use these products. More on that later. So even if at first only 1% of people, uh, 1% of men, you know, take a pill like this or a, or a contraceptive like this, that's still an enormous number of people. Um, and this giant nebulous group of every man on the planet, it makes for kind of a double-edged sword. Sure. There are a few billion potential users out there, and there aren't a lot of products for them. I mean, any male trying to prevent pregnancy has only condoms and vasectomies right now. And so any product out there competing with that should be able to grab a big piece of the pie. But at the same time, nobody really knows what that one product should be. Nobody knows how we address the needs of all men with a one-size-fits-all birth control method. And on top of that, if you try and ask men what they want, you tend to get all kinds of answers. Some want implants, some want a pill, some want something else, and all of these thoughts kind of come from this vacuum in space. None of these guys have ever tried a daily birth control method. None of these guys have ever gotten an implant. 
it's probably hard to tell what might work for you if you haven't tried it. And the devil is in the details for male contraception. There are methods in development that are designed to eventually come in pills and implants and patches and so on, but they're not done yet. We have no idea what men will think when they actually end up using them. Will the side effects end up putting people off? Will they find a daily dose really annoying? Or are men just really against injections? We don't know how these things are going to be marketed or what they're going to cost or how men are actually going to get their hands on them over the counter, through a primary care physician, a specialist like a urologist. Everyone wants a big menu of options, but right now there isn't even one. The, the first product that gets out on the market will probably not be, as with a lot of things, the like be all and end all. But I think it can be a proof of concept and get people excited about it. And on our show today, we're going to do something a little different than in previous episodes. I'll be your only host today, and we're going to dig around in this space. We've got three guys that want to tell their stories and talk about what they think about male birth control. We'll talk about relationships, the future, and how contraception can change what we think about masculinity. These guys are from different walks of life, different backgrounds, and they have different motivations. But all of them are interested in male contraception because they see a benefit for them and for the world as a whole. These are guys that intend to be a part of contraception as it develops, and they're all participating in their own ways right now, trying to get male birth control out there sooner. More from all of them, coming up. From Male Contraceptive Initiative, this is Intended. I'm Logan Nichols. So Will Skinner is working as a researcher in male birth control. He's at the lab bench, day in and day out, trying to learn more about the world, specifically ways to make male birth control. He's kind of a unique situation. A lot of researchers get into the field because they find some specific piece of science interesting. Like some people study sperm because they think reproduction is a really cool process, or it's what they got specialized in. Will is different. He got into this field specifically because he wanted to make a male contraceptive. Yeah, um, that that's a, that's a great point. Um, my path to being a professional scientist has been sort of a long and convoluted one. Um, Will went to college, he got a biology got degree, a degree and he was looking for a job that would grab him. Uh, he did genetics and plant biology for a year or so after he graduated, but he never really seemed to find his groove. For a year, which was uh, plant phylogenetics. It was like exploring the genetic relationships between different species of flowering plants native to French Polynesia. Um, but I never got to actually go to French Polynesia. I just worked with DNA samples frozen from French Polynesia. And I worked there for a year. And then at the end, I was like, wait a minute. This took a year of my life. I don't actually care about that at all. After this lab stint, he spent time in the nonprofit world and in social justice scenarios. And he was trying to do things that he thought were meaningful. Things that were meaningful both in the bigger sense and for himself. So I went and did a whole bunch of other stuff. I worked in the nonprofit sector. I worked in renewable energies. I was like trying to find like a problem that felt like tackleable and felt like interesting enough to keep my attention. That's 2017, I started thinking about male contraception and I just fell down this rabbit hole and we can talk maybe a little more in depth about like how I ended up. And one thing that really grabbed Will was how much of an impact male birth control could make on the world. He was reading about all the data around female contraception how women have access to contraception, have better health outcomes, economic outcomes, and education, and so on. And he thought, couldn't male birth control have some of those same effects? Like, if we reduce unplanned pregnancies, either from the male side or the female side, shouldn't those benefits um, still grow? Better, educationally, socioeconomically. Um, and so it's it's also can be a way to... Um, to bridge this like income inequality gap that we have and, and opportunity inequality gap that we have in this country. So I think that's, there's an angle that, that this can um, improve economic justice as well. He's thinking about the world wholesale and how he can make a bigger impact and he thinks male contraception can offer a way to make that difference. Doing a job that didn't have some sort of big ultimate purpose wasn't what he wanted. He wanted one that did have that purpose, one like male contraception. So he did some studying, and then, then he made some phone calls. As I started getting interested in male contraception, I just started cold calling and cold emailing um, everybody I could find that I thought was doing interesting, cool work in the field. And almost without fail, people were excited to talk to me and, and willing to email back and meet for coffee. And I think that's a function of the fact that, that honestly, the male contraception field is pretty small. You know, it's, it's a 
you know, we're not, it's not cancer biology, right? If I feel like if I showed up at a cancer conference and I said, hey, I wanna help cure cancer, they'd be like, great kid, you know, get in line. But in the male contraceptive field, I think because it's maybe an idea that some people don't resonate with or get um, right off the bat, uh, I think when people find someone who also is excited about the idea, it feels like kindred spirits. People are like, oh, yes, you get why this is important and why it could be a big game changer. So. And out of this, he found a lab that he really liked. He applied to grad school, and he's now working in the lab towards something he can believe in something he genuinely thinks is a tool to change the world. Now, Will might be a unique case of commitment, someone who found a calling and diverted their entire career towards it. But not everybody's as feet first as Will can be. Will very specifically found this field motivating, and he sought out a way to take part in it. He chose getting behind the lab bench and doing science and furthering knowledge and getting us closer by working on what could eventually be a male birth control product. Other people who are interested in the field have found other ways to get involved. You see conversations on Reddit and Twitter and these little voices, these advocates who are using small outlets to let people know, I care about this topic. You can find videos explaining male birth control or testimonials about why men and women alike wish that were an option. And overall, there's this sense of interest and optimism, like our own little grassroots advocacy. In fact, I was cruising YouTube a while ago, and I came across this one video in particular. It's called, Where is the Male Pill? It's always these kind of video clips. This kind of advertisements and reviews. You see my point here. And this video just grabbed me in a way that was so unique. It had these interesting little animations. It had perspectives on history and contraception. And with Margaret Sanger and gender and science, it did some myth busting. And... And I ended up watching it a few times, catching these little details and realizing that whoever made this thing was dedicated. They had done their homework. And they spent a lot of time that was crafting a message that was accurate and smart and compelling. So I wondered, who made it? Why were they so interested in male birth control? So I reached out. Of course. So uh, my name is Kesra and I'm 32 year old. And uh, I used to be a scientist. Kesra is the second guy that you're going to hear from today. And just like Will, Kesra likes science. He used to work in a lab that his own diabetes research. And he started life as a graphic designer because he felt it was a way to reach out to people, to communicate issues that he cares about. Yeah, that's where I'm, I'm at right now. And uh, so I'm just doing my things in Switzerland and trying to, you know, touch people with videos and a very important topic in uh, male. Like most men, male birth control didn't really ever cross Kesra's mind. Like, there are some options out there, but they're all for women, and so it's kind of not my thing to worry about. I have to admit, and I guess I'm in the same case that uh, a lot of men out there, I just didn't think about it because women are responsible for it. But he found that in some of his relationships, his partners were getting tired of the pill, of the side effects, of being the person taking on that load. What I can see and realize is that they're a bit fed up with the pill and taking hormones and things like that. So, And for Kessera, it meant that in his relationship, he was seeing a need for a better solution, one that his partner could be happier with. But as you might know, not all methods are created equal. My current girlfriend, actually, does not take the pill, so... What happened is that one one day, uh, well, we uh, doing this so-called pull-out technique, and I became quite good at it until I wasn't anymore. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they had a pregnancy scare, and they went to the pharmacy, got some Plan B, the emergency contraceptive you can take the morning after, and that's when it clicked for Kesra. Shouldn't there be a way I can take a bigger role here? Why can't I help my partner more with birth control? So uh, I was uh, looking it up and trying to see what else is there for men. And there was not so many uh, contraceptive methods. And I told her that day, yeah, well, you know, I think it's stupid. And I'm going to make a video about that. And that's how I got really interested into uh, the topic. So Kasra made this video. From nine different countries, would you use a contraceptive method? Six out of ten men said yes. One that explains where the male pill is and why we don't have it yet and what's going on right now in this really clean and insightful way. Kessera sees his role in male contraception as one of outreach and advocacy, one where he can inject information, discussion, and moments into the world to start a conversation. As convenient as the female pill have been found for men, and injections methods could be... He can put a YouTube video out there, and then when someone like him, someone who has a question, tries to find more information, they actually find something that's engaging. 
One of the reasons Kessera thinks it's really important to start these conversations is because men don't seem to have them without a prompt. Men are buttoned up and conditioned to not want to engage in the space of reproductive health. Uh, well, um, it's a sad thing to say, but we still live in a society that is very, uh, in a way, macho. And there's a lot of men out there. They don't. They're. You know, they don't want to be involved in contraception. Uh, maybe I should also think about the fact that I'm responsible for procreating uh, and giving birth also, uh, and maybe I should be responsible for it. He thinks that by putting bits of information out there, that he can get men to soften, or at least redefine what they think about masculinity. Get it to include talking about reproductive health and birth control and responsibility. And right here is where I want to introduce our third friend. I don't know if necessarily having um, the male birth control would necessarily change the beliefs around masculinity, but I definitely think that it would change our the way we the way we plan our families, the way we go about having sexual relations. I think it would change that stuff. I'm not I'm not gonna say that it would necessarily change the masculine beliefs. This is Tyrone. Okay, um, Tyrone Fields, um, Bachelor of Public Health Education, uh, Second Lieutenant of the United States Air Force. Uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Tyrone is someone that I met at a random chance thing. It was a meeting with a bunch of public health professionals. Usually when I go to these sorts of things, I'm the only guy. Public health is a field without a lot of men in it. And Tyrone, he happened to be there at this meeting. He was a public health student then, and we started talking about male contraception. Tyrone was in the ROTC at North Carolina Central University. He's since joined the Air Force. And his interest in public health was about community, about building up the people around him. After we met, we kind of just kept the conversation going, and Tyrone stayed interested in the topic. So much so that he ended up being one of the founding members of our Youth Advisory Board here at Male Contraceptive Initiative. The Youth Advisory Board at MCI is just that. It's a group of young voices and advocates who want to use their unique perspective as the users of the future to help guide things today. And when we met, one thing that got Tyrone really interested in male birth control was his interest in masculinity and relationships. Uh, yes, for my senior internship, I worked with the North Carolina Central University Women's Center. And I did a lot of work there with the prevention and education coordinator around sexual assault and domestic violence. And my specific um, work that I was working on was looking at how negative Negative masculinity correlates to our social and physical health of men. The men specifically One thing we kept talking about was how is masculinity going to affect male birth control? Like, there's been a half century of movement where contraception has been geared towards women. Even the most progressive guy out there will admit that there are expectations in reproductive health that are driven by gender. If society has shaped contraception as women's responsibility, will men feel emasculated taking on some of that responsibility? Yes. Yes and no. So in the I guess on the yes side of it, some men, I feel men who specifically men who express these hypermasculine beliefs, may feel that they're limited in their manhood. And what Tyrone means here when he says hypermasculine beliefs, he's talking about a kind of toxic masculinity. Uh negative masculinity, kind of that 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 macho that I always gotta be in control, I always gotta be in power. Um, yeah, just I'm always got to be the alpha male, I always got to be the one that's just in charge, running things, and I got to dominate, and I always got to have a power in the situations. Some men operate entirely in this realm, that they have to be the ones to rely on themselves and no one else, a sort of lone wolf mentality. It's one tied into masculinity and manhood in general. But on the other side of that argument, what, what better protection can I have than knowing that I'm taking something? You know what I mean? A lot of people joke about male contraceptives, you know, people are like, oh, that would be great. Da, 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 da. But when you when you sit down and have a real conversation about it, it's like guys are serious about it. And especially like the guys that are around my age and the people I've been talking to, my friends and frat brothers and stuff, they're really interested in having male contraceptives. We need to take on some of the responsibility ourselves. And this responsibility piece, it came up with Kessera and Will, too. In fact, all the guys I interviewed at some point talked about how it's the responsible thing for them to do for more men to step up and take ownership of the reproductive capabilities to commit themselves to this arena. 
and their flavors of responsibility were different here and there, but they were pretty much the same. Will focused on the importance of autonomy in the relationship. I, I often say that I think uh, making a baby should be like the hunt for Red October, that two people should have to turn their key at the same time in separate rooms in order for, in order for it to happen, right? So I don't think- Whereas Kessler and Tyrone kind of gave an answer that focused on communication and acting as a unit. The, the, the young people out there that, uh, yes, there's a problem uh, because we are uh, seeing reproduction as mainly a female, uh, contraception as a female responsibility it shouldn't be that way. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we need to be two to have sex. And uh, I think both of the people should be responsible for, for, for this, for the consequences. Of um, no, I, you can't just put it on one partner. Um, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. It takes both of us to make it happen. So why shouldn't both of us hold that responsibility equally? and kind of decide what happens that way together. Ultimately, these guys are saying the same thing, that taking a role in family planning, that's a responsible thing to do. And responsibility, stepping up and leaning in, that could appeal to men. Who are we to say that men might find male birth control emasculating? They might find it empowering. And autonomy and individualism and self-reliance, these are all really good empowering qualities to go after but sometimes they can be taken too far. For example, there's these men's rights groups out there, and they want male contraception for some kind of gross reasons. Fairly extremist men's rights groups, like Red Pillars, that express these really anti-feminist and misogynistic positions. They think that male contraceptives can offer them something that finally allows them to be separated from women. They think that women are out there to trap them in relationships with child support or custody battles, and they see male birth control and the autonomy that can provide as a way to further divide men and women instead of creating supportive partnerships. But they're still interested in the products, and even though they have these problematic views of manhood and masculinity, they certainly don't think that birth control is going to feminize them. Maybe our old stereotypical views of masculinity are getting outdated in these sorts of roles. What's manly, what's not? That seems to be changing in the world. Uh, you know, mentalities are changing the... the you know, the, what is it to be a man? What is it to be a woman? What are the role? What, what are your responsibilities? All that are changing. And for, my, for example, I love to cook, which was considered like a female thing. But I know that I cook for all my friends. I'm like kind of the mama for them. And I love it. And uh, the thing is that so, we have this... So, we want to circle back to that big question at the beginning. The one that we've been avoiding. Will men use male birth control when it finally gets to market? It's a big, complicated question. There are all sorts of motivators that could make a difference in if men use contraception. So one stereotype of a guy that would, why does he want to use it? And on top of that, what sort of products are we talking about here? Pills that last for a day? Implants that last for a year? A small outpatient procedure that involves surgery in your scrotum? We don't have male birth control options yet, and we're going to need to pick some kind of method in the end. So, let's talk about it. We'll talk about the attitudes and the opinions of men around male birth control, and we'll talk with our trio, Kessera, Will, and Tyrone, about the sort of products that they want. More coming up after the break. Support for Intended is provided by Male Contraceptive Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit that advances the research and development of new methods of male contraception. MCI funds scientific research that gets male birth control options to market sooner. Epin Pharma is one of our grantees, and they're working on a male contraceptive that you can take on demand. The basis of, of how the drug works, it doesn't allow the pH inside the sperm to go up. And that prevents hyperactivation as well, because you need, you need the sperm to become depolarized in order to get your calcium to come in, your pH to go up, and your hyperactivation. And that, when in the presence of the drug, it doesn't happen. Did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> Learn more about MCI and our grantees at malecontraceptive.org. That's malecontraceptive.org. Okay. Welcome back to Intended. I'm your host, Logan Nichols, and this is the podcast where we talk through male birth control, why it's not available yet, when it might be, and who's the kind of person that's interested in it. We got three guys that we're highlighting today, and we're asking them, what do you think about male birth control? 
All three of these guys are a little more involved than your average Joe. We've got Will, who's actually a grad student trying to make male birth control by harnessing sperm motility. We've got Kessera, who's a graphic designer in Zurich who made a video on YouTube trying to get the word out. And then we've got Tyrone, who's interested in public health, part of the Air Force, and he sits on the Youth Advisory Board for MCI. All these guys are interested in male contraception for mostly the same reasons. Because it just makes sense that people, that couples, have more ways to protect themselves against pregnancy. But these are just three people. And there's still the bigger question. Will men, like the broader definition of men, generally use these products? Will there be some traction among three point whatever billion men in this world? Enough to make a male birth control successful? Turns out there's some data around this. A 2005 study asked over 9,000 men across four continents about birth control, their experiences, their understanding, and their willingness to use a method of their own. There were nine countries represented here, across North and South America, Europe, and Asia. And by and large, around 55% of them said they were willing or very willing to use a new method of birth control. There was some range to the data, like Spain had a favorable response rate in the 70s, while majority Muslim countries like Indonesia were closer to 30. But this is telling. More than half of men, across cultures and settings and conditions, they're interested in using male contraceptive methods. A different study found something similar, in that half of Australian men were either definitely or probably willing to try a new male birth control method. And just to give these studies some context, they both took place in the 2000s, and the method of birth control that they were asking about was a hormonal method. Because of the time, and, well, still, hormonal contraception for men is the closest thing to actually getting there. And the kind of method that gets out there could really influence how men take up a product, if they're interested in it. Some men might want an injection, something that lasts for months at a time. And some men might find needles off pudding, and they might want a daily pill instead. Some men may want something we haven't even asked about yet, like a temporary vasectomy. That big study with 9,000 men, that got into it some. They found that a daily oral pill was the most desirable route of administration, followed by something like an injection or an implant. But there were differences across countries, and when it comes down to it, these men being studied, they haven't tried using birth control yet. They're having to rely on what they think they know from partners or pop culture or their own lives to make an assumption. And they certainly aren't thinking about the methods of the future, ones that could be non-hormonal or have benefits above and beyond contraception. But even if those 9,000 men haven't used birth control yet, and they're subject to their own bias and experience, there are men out there who have used male birth control. Remember the clinical trials we talked about for hormonal male contraception? Those men get asked what they think about the method that they're using. And most of them like it. There are injections and gels that men have tried, and same as the surveys, somewhere around half of them, usually a little more, are satisfied or extremely satisfied with the method and would recommend it to others. In a previous episode, we talked about a trial that was canceled for safety concerns and mood effects. Even in that trial, only 5% of the men said they wouldn't use a method like this in their everyday life. And sure, this data might be a little biased, like the kind of guy to sign up for a male birth control study is probably more prone than the average to end up taking it and using it. But it's remarkable that this question persists. People always ask, will men use it? Even in the face of survey data and real user experience and tons of anecdotes? I mean, not all men are going to use this. We see that some men are satisfied with the options they have, or some men are worried about side effects, and even some men take the position that women get pregnant and so women need to be the ones to manage contraception. But again, three and a half billion men in this world. Surely, surely there's a market in there somewhere. Especially if when you just pose the question, half of men say they're interested. So, before we move on, I'd like to dispense with the myth that men won't use contraception. The studies I mentioned are not the only ones out there. Other cultures, other questions about men and contraception. Broadly, we know that men are interested in new birth control products. A big chunk of men. And when we ask the question, but will they use it? I think we do a disservice to that big chunk. MCI did our own consumer research study recently, and we showed that more than eight in 10 men of general reproductive age are trying to prevent pregnancy. That illustrates a need, a market, men who have a goal and need tools to help them achieve that goal. When we dug in, we found a potential market of more than 17 million men in the United States alone. And we asked those men what they thought, Consistent with every other piece of data out there, about a half of men were very likely to use those methods, with even more being somewhat likely. Like the other studies, we found that most men were interested in a pill, but with one difference. 
we didn't just want to ask about daily pills, things that look like contraceptives are out there now. We also asked about on-demand contraception, taking a pill right before sex. And we found that that was the most popular method. Over 7 in 10 men were either very or somewhat interested in that method. Close behind, men were interested in taking a pill regularly, and around half were still interested in a gel. And then still, over a quarter men were interested in getting something like an implant. These attitudes, these perceptions, men all have their reasons for wanting what they want. But the number 7 in 10 doesn't really illustrate why men might prefer a pill or a gel or a shot or whatever. Just like men in different countries have different experiences and motivations and cultural lives, they probably have different feelings on what sort of form their birth control takes. So, I wanted to explore this with our three guests, Will, Kessler, and Tyrone. What sort of method do they want? I had this conversation yesterday with my girlfriend, it's funny. My ideal method of contraception, I, I don't know, because when I think of all of the contraceptives for women, it's like, what could we, I guess, kind of steal on our side of the tracks? <laughs> but maybe a pill, pill or one of those implant or something like that. I don't know. Like lots of men, Tyrone is used to what he knows. He sees the pill in everyday life and in culture, and he thinks, hey, it could work. It works for them. He also sees other methods he knows about, like the implant, as a way to manage things long term. A low-maintenance way to manage contraception. And that low-maintenance thing? It seems to appeal to Kessera too. Something that, you know, that would be easy, which means that, you know, like that I don't have to, for example, have an injection every day. So something that should be convenient and uh, safe. That's, I think, the most important and reliable, of course. Uh, you know, otherwise I would not take it. But uh, Sure. Kessera, like all men, wants something safe and reliable. But he didn't bring up a method he's seen partners use or ask what we could learn from female contraception. He very specifically here wants something new, something that's totally different from existing methods. He ended up calling out one method in particular called RISIG, a vas occlusive method we covered earlier in the series. That's a gel that gets injected in the vas deferens of men, that tube that connects the testes with the rest of the reproductive system and transports sperm. It's the same tube that gets cut during a vasectomy, and vas occlusive devices like RISIG are seeking to block the flow of sperm through that tube, but do it in a way that's actually reversible. And methods like RISIG have the potential to last for years. One developer we talked to who's working on a vas occlusive called it the IUD for men. Sure, it takes a small surgical procedure, but once that's done, you're set for a really long time. And that worry-free, super long-term approach to birth control is appealing to lots of men, as long as it's safe, reliable, and of course, reversible. Uh, for example, that it should be reversible. And the problem that we have with uh, with vasectomy is, uh, well, it's not reversible, obviously, and uh, it needs to be uh, without any danger or side effects. And I, I think those are the basic requirements, of course. Now, I do want to go into this a little. He said without danger, without side effects. What's being described here is what men want, ideally. In a perfect world, every person, man or woman, would have a contraceptive option that works exactly how they want it to, 100% effective, no barriers to access, no concerns about social acceptability, and, of course, no side effects. And there very well could be a big disconnect between the ideal and the reality of many male contraceptives in development. I talked with Will about this some, kind of in the context of the methods that he's working on and what he thinks would be best for men as a whole. Let, let's start with my ideal and work backwards. My ideal form of contraception would be like, having a, a long-term tool that they that he could start to use you know it, after puberty and um and stop using 10 or 15 years later when he's ready to have kids um and would have a low side effect profile and so building back from that that's a that's a pretty hard thing to do honestly it's a pretty hard thing to do because firstly making a drug with a low side effect profile can be hard no matter what the drug is but male contraceptives have to cover that extra hurdle. These are new products, something unlike anything else in that they don't treat a medical condition, they don't mitigate any health risks in men, and the FDA has to weigh that risk and benefit of new drugs in a really clear and cold sort of way. Uh, so getting an individual compound through the FDA approval process is very hard, and I would argue that it's maybe even harder for male contraception, which is a point I could talk about for hours, but, but basically I think that because this is a drug that would be taken by healthy individuals 
for a long period of time who don't bear any personal uh, uh, physical risk from getting someone else pregnant, uh, the allowable side effect profile for the FDA is likely to be very low. Um, whereas for female contraception, you can, in some cases, weigh the the, the side effects, the, the large side effects of female hormonal contraception against the still non-zero chance of death during pregnancy. It's hard to say what sort of side effects men would tolerate. It's hard to say what sort of side effects the FDA would tolerate. There's really not a lot of data out there to begin with, and when you ask what sort of side effects do you not want in your hypothetical birth control method, most men are going to say, no side effects, please. We don't know if acne or headaches or something else will prevent men from using contraceptives. Tyrone thinks that there are some things that could turn men off birth control, like side effects, but it won't prevent them from using birth control entirely. The only, the only piece of that that I feel I could possibly agree with is a side effect. Um, that is scary. That's scary because a lot of us have seen some of the negative side effects that women may have, like I said, with the weight gain of the pseudotumors or be, worrying about those. Yes. But as far as not wanting to do it, I disagree with that. I think I definitely think guys will buy into it. Yeah. Definitely think we would. Ultimately, the things that are important in a new birth control method for men are simple. It has to be safe. It has to be effective. And it has to be reversible. But once we start getting into the weeds, it's hard to say. Is it okay if the method is 95% effective? That's a full 10% better than the condom, but it isn't 99%. Is it okay if it's 95% reversible? That there's that small chance that you'll be irreversibly sterilized? Is it okay that it comes with a few side effects? Which ones matter most? Sex drive? Mood? Acne? Would it be more tolerable if we added something to the pill that made it more fun, like we combined it with Viagra? These questions can't be answered now, because there aren't products for men to try. By the same token, they likely won't be answered by any one single product, much less any one single man. Just as some men want a pill, and some want an injectable, and some want a long-term, no-maintenance option, some men are going to have priorities on what they think makes a male birth control method acceptable. And that's why it's so important that we come out of this knowing that, sure, when surveyed, most men envision a pill of sorts as their form of contraception. But a lot of other men envision other things too. And a lot of men don't know what's possible because their expectations are framed around the birth control options they're familiar with. Once they've had a chance to actually try a birth control method, they might find that they only thought they knew what they wanted. Making male birth control shouldn't mean one single daily pill gets developed and put on the market and that's the end of it. A menu of options should be developed to meet the needs of a big, diverse group of men. Options with different delivery modes, effectiveness times, and, and of course, you know, side effects. I'm not really in the field, uh, so that m I cannot imagine what else could be uh, invented. But yes, it should be reliable, safe, uh, and yeah, convenient to use. That's and then the, the shape or I don't know what they can you know I don't really care about the design and all that. I, I just need to, uh, that it work you know and it doesn't. So male birth control faces some high barriers to get out there. The products have to achieve certain benchmarks in safety and efficacy, and then beyond that, they have to appeal to men in a certain way. Men who all have different opinions and ideas about what makes a method perfect. But there are other barriers. Barriers that aren't focused around necessarily the design of the product or its technical development, but instead more just about getting men to realize that this is a thing, that it's in development. I can't count how many times I've told people what I do for a living work at a nonprofit focused on male birth control and gotten people to say, oh, no way, that's a thing? Usually dudes say that. Women, I get a different answer from. Usually something like this. Every time I talk with them, they were like, oh, it's about time, you know, uh, that you do something, and which, I, which I understand, you know. And, uh, and I get it. So Women are more connected with reproductive health than men. They see specialists that focus on that specific area of health, starting from an early age. Whereas men don't see their equivalent, a urologist or something, until they're usually much, much older. And this means that women are more in tune with contraception, how it works, the impact, and the idea that, oh yeah, birth control for men is not only possible, but it should already exist. Men are kind of out of the loop because, well, they tend to be disengaged from reproductive health in general. And that means that conversations between guys and their partners, conversations about family planning and about birth control, they generally don't happen except under exceptional circumstances, 
uh, I have the feeling that uh, we are raised to believe that it's a female responsibility, which I believe it is not. Uh, the problem is that when then men try to take this responsibility, uh, there's nothing for them out there. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, I never talked with them with my uh past uh in my past relationship and my partners we never really talked about it there was this theme that kept coming up in conversations that these three guys casero tyrone and will they all want to be a part of reproductive health they all want to be there for the partners and responsibly take part in this big world of family planning but they all felt that there weren't good avenues for them to do so they wanted to be there to participate but they also want to be respectful of their partner and their partner's autonomy since the only realistic option for all these men is condoms, it made it kind of difficult to participate. So it was the same. So, uh, yeah, the, the problem is that it, it, it seems like it's a fact. There's, there are condoms and nothing else, but it doesn't have to be that way. And because of that, it's led to this world where even the guys with the best intentions, the ones who want to participate and be a part of birth control in a productive, healthy way, they're just left with condoms, a limited slate that does turn some men off. Sadly to say, a lot of my friends, a lot of people I meet don't like to use condoms. Don't like to use condoms. They always talk about feel and that type of thing. So if we could have something, um, that would be great. So how do we grab men? How do we engage them in a valuable way in reproductive health? I think there's a sense that uh, a, a rising tide lifts all boats, that like that we as the people who like understand that this is important, uh, all need to work together to convince a broader community of funders or supporters or, or um, whomever it might be that this is important. So I think there's a real team mentality there. Will thinks it's a communications effort at its core, that research will eventually produce a male birth control product and it will be taken up by men in due time, and that what we need to do now is facilitate conversations, facilitate them so that when this product actually comes out, some men are prepared to use it and are literate and comfortable enough in the language to tell their friends about it. People make their contraceptive decisions, I think, mostly based on, you know, uh, what they see their, their peers and their friends doing, right? And so I think as that snowballs, I think that will we'll gain traction. And this idea of peer support, of community, of role models, there isn't something like that for such a niche topic like male birth control right now. We don't have celebrities making statements at the Academy Awards about this. We don't have athletes dedicating their massive Twitter followings to the cause. You look to the people who you idolize, I mean, to make those decisions, because, I mean, that's, in a sense, a lot of people, that's how you learn to be a man, I guess, who you are as a man. You learn it from the people you look up to. So in the absence of role models, these guys, these three men who have, in some form or fashion, answered the call and tried to be a part of male contraception, They've tried to be the role models they feel the world needs. That the people I talk to, especially young people, um, increasingly seem to, to get the idea. Um, uh, like older, fo you know, older folks I talk to, you know, there's a mixed bag of, eh, you know, I, I didn't need it in my life. I like we got here. It's OK. But like when I talk to young people, they're like, oh, yes, thank you. Like, hurry up. So uh, so I'm glad to hear that that. It, it, it resonates with them, so. And ultimately, they think that these conversations can convince men to be engaged, to at least start the conversation and be proactive and take ownership of this thing that they possess and share with their partners. It's a simple thing. I, I think male should be engaged by themselves. And so uh, first we have to change the mentalities uh, that uh, f reproduction is not only a female uh, responsibility because, of course, biologically, women carry a uh, child, the uh, children, and give birth to children, and uh, men are in the passenger seat and just watch everything. And changing that mentality? That's a pretty big lift. Not only because there's centuries of ingrained societal norms to undo, but because it requires a fundamental trust between two parties. The reproductive autonomy for women has been the subject of intense political debate and has fostered an atmosphere of division, of mistrust. Why should a woman trust anyone besides herself to do what's best for her and her body? Why should they allow men into the fold of an environment that disproportionately affects women? Why do you think we should trust men to be the responsible one here when it comes to reproductive health? More coming up after the break. Support for Intended is provided by Male Contraceptive Initiative, 
a 501c3 nonprofit that advances the research and development of new methods of male contraception. MCI funds scientific research that gets male contraceptives to market sooner. Contraline is one of our grantees, and they're working on making a male birth control option that could last for years. So we're working on the first long-lasting non-hormonal and reversible male contraceptive that uses a gel to occlude the vast deference. So we aim to position this a little bit kind of like an IUD for men. Learn more about MCI and our grantees at malecontraceptive.org. That's malecontraceptive.org. Okay, welcome back. This is Intended, where we tell you about male birth control, who intends to use it, and what a future with expanded contraceptive choice looks like. I'm Logan Nichols. And we're talking today mostly with three guys, Tyrone, Will, and Kessera. Tyrone is in the Air Force and cares about public health. Will is a graduate student researching male birth control. And Kessera is a graphic designer who uses his YouTube channel to talk about things he cares about. And we talked with them about the sort of contraceptives that they would like, why they're into the field as a whole, and what they see their benefits being. But we haven't talked too much about relationships, what male contraceptives would mean for them and their female partners together. And this was something that we thought was really important to explore. Like, we've been talking about getting men involved in the conversation and taking a role in reproduction. So what does it mean for them now? I asked Tyrone what his conversations look like between him and his girlfriend when they talk about birth control and potential male options. The conversation is like she tried the implant and she had some of the negative side effects from it. If we, if I could have something that necessarily wouldn't give me that stuff, um, the negative health effects, it would be great. You know what I mean? It would be great. We could still achieve the same goal of family planning and starting our family when we want to. So yeah, it would just be great. What Tyrone's describing here is a common thing. The partner of some guy is using an option that isn't working out well. It's side effects or it's cost or it's some other barrier that makes them want to just throw their hands up entirely. And this is highly dependent on the relationship and the people and a whole host of other factors. But the guy in the scenario is generally left hanging. Sure, a man can be supportive and he can offer his help in myriad ways, but other than using condoms, he can't take an active participation. And we should say here that condoms, totally valid contraceptive method. Used widely, very cheap, and indeed something for the couple to consider in this scenario. But remember, condoms have around a 15% unintended pregnancy rate. That's not exactly foolproof. So it would make sense to give men that option, something that he, along with his partner, can discuss and figure out if it works for them. Um, you know, women bearing the sole responsibility of, of contraception, there's downsides to that as well. Um, and there's, you know, there's, it allows for this, a, a different sort, obviously not an, as severe a sort of gender imbalance where, where men are now taking uh, like no role in the reproductive. This idea that there's an imbalance in contraception, it seems to be coming from a good place with all these dudes. They want to have male contraceptives because they think will not only provide autonomy in the relationships, but will give them new options to meet goals as a coupled unit. It could be a societal game changer for, for gender dynamics in our country. Um, I wasn't alive in the 60s, but I think, I think most folks would agree that the availability of the first birth control pills was a key factor in sort of the, the revolution in the role of women in this country. And I think that having men have a tool that allows them to take an active role in, in fertility planning could sort of um, encourage them to be more active and thoughtful in, in the, the way men approach reproduction and, and reproductive rights. Kassara echoed some of this too. Uh, it's a bit more fair. But there's still a long way to go. And I think with this development of female uh, or, uh, rights, you know, then maybe that will push men to rethink who they are and uh, what they should do. But this brings us to another question, one that comes up often. Will women trust men to use male birth control? I mean, let's say the guy screws up or the method fails. The female partner is the one with an unintended pregnancy. She has, physically and biologically and mentally, all of the above, been made the primary recipient of all the fallout from that failure. She's now the one with the pregnancy and has to navigate all the waters around it. So should she trust her body, her autonomy, to her male partner? 
And as we said a second ago, in response to the idea of, you know, will women trust men to take it? Um, my answer is I don't think they should unless they already trust the men in their life, right? In, in For example, you know, I am in a long-term committed monogamous relationship and um, I would love to take on that burden and, and, you know, free my partner Katie from some of the, like, negative side effects she's experienced with her contraception. Um, but obviously that's not right for everybody. And, um, and I think in most cases, having each individual uh, have their own control, I think, would be great. This goes back to Will's hunt for Red October analogy. Both parties should have the key that they have to dramatically stick in the lock and turn at the same time for this irreversible process to begin. Will is in a relationship where his partner would trust him to take on a contraceptive role because, well, he's in a trusting relationship. And shouldn't we be thinking of it that way? Doesn't trust come down to an individual thing, a relationship between two people? Do you trust the person you're with? If not, I imagine you shouldn't rely on them to be the sole user of contraception. If so, maybe it's something you can think about. I mean, I guess it's a two-way street. I guess it's a two-way street. I guess that gets to get down gets down to the point of, I mean, do you trust your partner? Do you know who you're actually having these sexual relations with? So I guess that's a personal thing, but yeah. Male contraception is important to these guys. They all wish it were here, and they're frustrated that it isn't. Well, uh, I'll be honest, I'm pissed. And I think it's unfair. Uh, there's no other way to put it, because as I told you, it doesn't have to be that way, but it is that way. They want something, anything else, so they feel like they have more options. More options than the, yes, ubiquitous and cheap and mostly reliable condom. Uh, specifically, I would love male contraceptives for myself. <laughs> because, I mean, you, we put all of the responsibility on women. What about guys? We need some of the responsibility as well. We need more than just condoms, so, yes. And they see a future with what male contraceptives could look like. These guys are dreaming big, and they're thinking about the future, probably in no small part because they know that these products are 10 to 20 years away. But they're helping to make it happen now because they're planting trees, trees that they may or may not be able to sit under. I also say I, I hope that by the time I have kids, um, they look back at, like, you know, unintended pregnancies like we look back at like polio now right like polio was not actually that long ago like i have a great friend who um walked for the cane because he had polio when he was young you know he's in his 70s but like that's that's one lifetime and now you know i look back and I'm like polio like in america who get what that's like seems like it's like the civil war or something but it wasn't that long ago and i hope that we have a tool that where we can say like yeah, unintended pregnancies are, like, not really much of a problem anymore. <laughs> so, that's the attitudes, opinions, and general roundup of three guys, all about male birth control. Next time, we're going to keep this theme. We're going to bring in the other half of the equation and hear from women who are also interested in male birth control, and they have their own attitudes, hopes, opinions, and frustrations. If this is he said, well, up next is she said. See you next time, Unintended. Special thanks for this episode goes out to Catherine Carpenter, Nika Daria, and of course, Tyrone, Will, and Kessera. Music from Blue Dot Sessions. Intended is written and produced by myself and Kevin Shane out of the offices of Male Contraceptive Initiative in Durham, North Carolina. Our executive director is Heather Vidat. I'm Logan Nichols. Intended is a project of Male Contraceptive Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to advancing the development of reversible, non-hormonal contraceptive options for men. For more information or to donate to our cause, visit malecontraceptive.org. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and other social networks by searching Male Contraceptive. If you'd like to check out Kessler's video on male contraception, head to our website, malecontraceptive.org slash intended. You can find the page for this episode. We put a link up there as well as on our social media. If you like intended, share us with your friends. Leave us a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. Thanks for listening. And now for something completely different. You are stinky. You are gross. You are the nastiest dog in this room.